All right, so now that we've covered sort of the low level and hardware and kernel components, let's zoom back out and look at the operating system itself and daemons in particular. Yes, I know it kind of looks like it spelled daemons or pronounced daemons, but it's just pronounced demons. A daemon is a process that runs in the background and behaves similarly to what a Windows service does on the Windows operating system. So just imagine it like a service that's in the operating system. You can create your own. If you have your own application, you can create a daemon that will start and stop when the operating system boots up and shuts down, and it'll just run in the background. Daemons respond to requests, and you can manipulate them in the operating system. So for example, you could have an Apache daemon, which will run your Apache web service. There are various daemons that come installed already with Linux when you install it and set it up. And then when you install applications, generally, if it's something that runs in the background, like a server or some sort of application, they will create their own daemon and then you can start and stop them using the command line interface. Almost all daemons by convention end with the letter D and that's kind of been picked up over time. It wasn't always that case. And sometimes you still will see services without that but it is a common protocol and some common daemon names and things that you'll see on modern Linux OSs are going to be stuff like systemd, dhcpd, etc. So let's take a look at how we install software on a Linux operating system. So due to the fact that there are so many flavors of Linux out there and people kind of want to do their own things in their versions, it's sometimes hard to figure out how to make software install correctly across different platforms. So package managers were created to sort of solve that issue. So package managers not only help you install software, but they also help you manage like the version. If there's updates available, it'll notify you. And they kind of provide that update feature that you can just run to upgrade existing software that you have on your system. So depending on the version of Linux that you're using, it's going to come with a different package manager. So that's determined by who sort of created that flavor of Linux that they decide what package managers are used. But also it's determined by the file system and the types of installation files required to run applications on that Linux version. So some common package managers that you're going to see in most flavors of Linux, this is going to be the vast majority, are going to be for Debian, which is Ubuntu and Kali Linux are based on Debian. So they're going to use dpackage as well as the apt advanced package tool or apt for short. Then you'll also have the Red Hat package manager or RPM, which is a different way of doing packages. It's kind of like a zip version of it. And then you'll also have yum, which is on CentOS, which is the open source version of Red Hat Linux. There's tons more out there. Everybody kind of likes to do their own specific variant of it because they like it to do different things and whatnot. But these are the main ones you're going to see out there. So you know, I recommend you getting used to these and the syntax. Another major component of Linux is sudo. Sudo is a sort of an application. It's a layer on Linux systems that lets you run things as administrator. That's as pretty much as simple as, as you can put it. In order to run a command as an administrator, you add the word sudo in front of your command in the command line. This tells a system that you want to elevate privileges in order to run that command as the root administrator user on the system. So if you want to be able to do that, your user needs to be listed in the Etsy sudoers config file, which is basically adding yourself to the administrators list. And this will grant you the ability to be able to use sudo to do administrative tasks and features on the Linux operating system. Something to be aware of though, and something that trips up a lot of new people is that when you do run something as sudo, you are running it as the root user. So if you have any paths or applications that need to run as your local user and they run as sudo, they're gonna be running in the context of the root user, a totally different user than you. 
So keep that in mind when you want to install software and you want it to be in your local user's directory. Don't run it as sudo because if you run it as sudo, it's going to put it in the root directory or the administrator's directory instead of your own local user. And on that same note, when you run applications or servers in Linux, you want to run them as the lowest possible privilege that you can. So if you're running a web server or any sort of public facing service, you want to run it as the lower level user, not root. You don't want to run it with sudo because that's going to grant that application root privileges. And if it were to get compromised or get hacked, that will grant that attacker root privileges on the system. We can't talk about Linux without talking about shells or command line shells. So the Linux shell, to put it simply, it's a program that collects input from a user in a text interface and then it interfaces with the Linux kernel and then executes some kind of function and then returns you the output. There's nothing crazy here and thankfully it's very simple and easy to use, but it is the main way that users interact with the Linux operating system. There are user interfaces now and they've become a lot more popular and much better than they used to be, but knowing the Linux shell is definitely probably the most uh, useful skill in learning Linux and operating with it. So the shell allows us to query the system, run commands, edit files. We can do everything from the shell. Linux commonly uses the born shell, which is just the sh, and you'll see it as a dollar character at the beginning at the left-hand side when you're in the terminal. That's how you know you're in the born shell. It's the older version and it has less functionality, which has been replaced by more modern version of the born shell, which is called the born again shell or bash. So Bash is going to give you a lot more functionality. It's more forgiving, gives you tab completion and things like that. And it has a lot more built into it by default. Thankfully, most modern Linux distros will have Bash set as the default shell. You can still switch back to the old version. And sometimes you'll log into an older Linux server or computer that runs the old born shell, the SH shell. While Windows is a preferred OS for enterprise businesses and a large variety of, of large companies and industrial applications, the nature of Linux and its just robustness and ease of use and simplicity really make it a go-to for a lot of different applications out there. So you'll see major enterprises, you'll see a large majority of Windows machines for users' workstations and application servers but you'll see also a large amount of Linux machines, usually web servers, file servers, different things like that, because Linux has proven itself to be very useful and very robust to run a long time without crashing and be a secure system. So let's dig into a few of these use cases and a few of the ways that Linux is used today, um, how it's just become really popular, it's exploded onto the scene and become very useful for many different applications. So Linux is used in a wide range of platforms, meaning different computer types, due to its open source kernel. So if you remember how we talked about how Unix was a proprietary operating system and then Linus and the GNU projects kind of wanted to make this free open source version of it. It means that it's free, it's open, anybody could use it, businesses, hobbyists, everybody is free to use it equally for whatever they want. So this is really great for a lot of people who want to create new products and they need something to operate the machinery that makes up their product. And so they can throw Linux on there. The open source extensibility makes it adaptable for different things. So you have the Linux main operating system, but you also have components that you can just tack onto the main operating system. So this makes it super useful for things like cell phones, embedded devices like in your refrigerator or in your car and even electrical grid components that your electric provider uses. So why is that? What is the difference between an embedded system or these small microchips versus like your Windows computer? The biggest deal is resources. So a Windows computer, especially a modern one, needs copious amounts of RAM and hard drive space to install software. They need to be able to perform over the year updates and also support a wide variety of users, right? It could be programmers and developers and more advanced users, but it can also be 
kids at the library using this operating system. So it has to support a wider range of uses, and so that means that it has to have a lot of software and a lot of components on there to support all those different use cases. Linux is much more focused, and you can basically strip it down to its bare-bone components and all that it needs to just function. It doesn't need a graphic interface. It doesn't need user programs. It doesn't need any of that stuff. So you can make it really super small and make it run pretty fast and very efficiently to put it on devices like smartwatches or even motion sensors and lighting systems, registers, toys. All these things have very, very, very small versions of Linux on them, usually. Sometimes they'll have proprietary stuff or won't even have an operating system at all because it can all just be programmed into the microchip. But anything that has an operating system, very, very high chances it's a version of Linux. IoT devices, which are just these little microcontrollers hooked up to our home devices and systems like our thermostats and doorbells, also are using Linux. And they also have the added benefit or detriment of being able to connect to the internet. So they can do updates and they can do their own machine learning and things like that. Other common applications of Linux that we see in enterprises and in more popular business use cases, let's say, are web servers, proxies, and databases. You'll also see them used in software development, especially when people are developing applications for Mac OS or Android operating systems. Developers need access to the same servers and operating systems that the applications are going to run on. So Obviously, they're going to be developing the software on Linux. We've done a very high-level overview of Linux here. We definitely didn't get way down in the weeds. There are a lot of components of Linux. And to be honest, Linux is a lot more simple than Windows. It does share a lot of features and components that Windows has. And you'll notice it in the many different flavors of Linux that even though they are different flavors and we call them distributions or distros for short, they have a lot in common and they share more in common than they than they do have differences. But Linux doesn't use DLLs or EXEs like Windows does. It uses ELF files, which stands for the executable and linkable format. So you can see even that kind of shares the similarities with DLLs, dynamic link libraries. It shares also common concepts like processes and services, which they're called daemons in Linux. Linux also supports many different package managers, which is kind of confusing because you have to switch up your syntax when you're jumping on different distributions. You have to sort of look up the syntax, but generally they're similar in the fact that you do an install operation, you do an upgrade, and you can do a remove or uninstall. The root user is the default Linux super user, and other users can invoke those privileges using the sudo command. So even if you're not a super user, administrator user, you can use sudo as long as you are in the sudoers list and you can elevate your privileges. This is kind of the equivalent on Windows of doing run as administrator. 